All right there, welcome everybody. 3 p.m. Eastern. Welcome, this is Drawing Together. My name's Scott Meyer. We're with Artist Network, where we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, to draw together. Uh, so as you can see, um, as you can see by the chat here and in the description, today we're working on drawing a castle ruins. Uh, I see some of the comments here, um, it, kind of anticipating a larger, uh, the kind of a full castle, and I did consider it. And then I got very intimidated <laughs> because there's so many elements to it. Um, and I thought by simplifying it down a little bit, at least we can cover some of the basics that hopefully you could then use to transition into a, a more complex subject. So um, if you are new to the show, what you're going to want to know is that this is all about us getting together to draw together. So there's a new subject each week and we find a way to use that subject to enhance something about our drawing and keep us moving forward, find some way to help us grow our understanding of art in general, as well as learn specific techniques or again, a deeper understanding of some of these concepts. So I'll talk through some of the things that I think about as I'm drawing. Um, I'd love to hear from you all as well. What, you know, what's going on for you? How is your drawing coming together? Um, differing opinions and observations are always welcome because that's why we're drawing together and this isn't just watch me draw. So uh, you'll find the reference image in the description below um, as well as a list of the materials that I'm using. Uh, this isn't um, necessarily designed to be completed exclusively in the materials that I list. So if you want to use an entirely different medium, hopefully some of the things that we cover here will be um, applicable to whatever medium you're using. Um, so in the chat, feel free to uh, shout out with any questions, comments, concerns, alternate opinions, observations. If you type them in all caps, I'm more likely to see them and I can get to your, uh, your questions more quickly. If I do miss a question, please uh, type it again. Sometimes the chat gets going and I miss them and I want to make sure I answer them all. So um, I love seeing where everybody is viewing from. We've got people from all over the world, which is awesome. All right, so let's get to it. We'll look at the drawing and uh, the materials I'll be using. Oh, what happened to my, where is my screen here? Let me see, hold on a sec. I need to figure out why that's not showing up. All right. We're not drawing just blank space here. What happened? Cam link four, there we go. That's the one we're looking for. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let me brighten this up. So here you can see my preparatory drawing. That was weird for some reason that wasn't connecting. Okay, this is the preparatory drawing. You can see the reference image below me um, that this is based on. Um, this was you know, relatively quick. We'll see how long we get through this um, and so what you'll learn in my process here is that what, the way I like to build a drawing is I try to build it all up at once. And that puts me in control of how much detail I add. When does it feel complete? You may want to stop earlier. You may want to keep going and add more detail. There's so much to really sink your teeth into with this subject. We have the contrasting textures of the stone, the grass, that distant mountain, the sky. Um, that th I think for me, a lot of this drawing, the subject is, is about an opportunity to really focus on texture. Uh, and the way I like to approach texture is I try to see how much of that texture can be um, created through just the, the natural and inherent qualities of the medium that we're using. So the medium I'm using here, I have, uh, this is the Pesha uh, cotton rag paper provided by Legion Paper. Um, I do like the cotton rag papers. They have a nice tooth to them. There's a soft quality to it. Um, for the graphite, I have three. What do I have? I have an H, I have a 6B, and then this, this general's extra black for a darker one. So I'll be kind of working mostly with these two pencils. You don't have to match what I have. I have a bias towards the softer graphites, and partly because it just shows up better on camera. So if you have kind of harder graphite, it can work just fine. If you have charcoal or other medium, it, it will as well. Um, Troy has a question about my book. Uh, my book is called See, Think, Draw. There's a link to it in the description below. Uh, that comes, it becomes available for print in June. It is available for pre-order now if you're interested in checking that out. And that was written uh, based on a lot of the things that we talk about here in this show. And I tried to distill things down into really the essential 
um, skills and uh, techniques that are helpful to know if you're getting started drawing. And the, I, the idea of my approach to drawing is that it's all about making specific decisions. And maybe, you know, we all order those decisions in different ways, but it's the decisions that we make that in the relationship we have between the subject and the materials in our own thoughts, that ultimately leads to a drawing. And so by following uh, this mindset, you can really tackle any subject because you're, you're making the same set of decisions, just applying it to different subjects. Um, and the hope is that out of it, you develop a daily drawing habit. Um, I don't get to draw every day, but this helps me draw every week at least, and that is a huge benefit. So, um, so thank you all. I'm excited for this one here. Let me see. We might have to lighten this up a little bit. It's a little dark. Oh, ooh, wrong way. No, nope, there we go. So that's going to be the best one. So with the lighting here in the studio, it can get a little little tricky. It looks a little dull here. It's a little bit brighter here, but uh, in order to show some of these subtle areas in the sky, I have to adjust things. So I may be playing around with that throughout the, the whole event here. Um, other materials, i got to mention. Um, erasers, I have... My trusty, this is a Derwent retractable eraser. This has become my favorite. And you can see that I have it carved down to this chisel tip, which gives me a nice uh, amount of precision and control. I have this very old kneaded eraser. So this this is you know, one of two kneaded erasers that I've used for the, the past two years of this show. So it gets, kind of shows you how long a kneaded eraser can last. This is starting to give up though. It's getting kind of sticky. So I think I need to move on to a new one, but is still working for my needs at right now. Um, and then finally for blending, I have this blending stump. This has been used for quite a while and it's really started to build up some uh, graphite on there. So that becomes helpful uh, with textures. And then I just have a paper towel to help wipe things down. So, okay, we got through a lot there. <laughs> Let's get to it. Um, I'll bring out the H pencil. And right off the bat, one of the things I notice in terms of value is that there's a contrast between the blue sky and the white clouds. Um, and then the, you have the, the white or the light values on the, the light side of the castle ruins there. Um, and what that kind of shows me is that there's going to be very few places on this whole drawing that are going to be the bright white of the page. So to uh, if I have that understanding right out of the gate, I'm just going to start toning the page. Um, using this uh, using this H pencil, kind of just building up some tones using the side of the pencil, holding it very far back so that there's a very light pressure on it. Um, it engages the, the broad side of the pencil um, core a bit more. And I'm going to just build up this tone. Actually, you know what? I'm going to switch to the 6B. I'm just going to go darker. Darker and softer. One of the downsides sometimes when working with the harder graphite is that it can emboss the page and kind of scratch it. it it's nice that it has this built-in light value associated with it, but um, it, like I said, it also scratches the surface. So I kind of, I, I'm kind of feeling like today at least I'm going to tone with the softer graphite, uh, which even though it's darker and perhaps a bit more aggressive will hopefully float on the surface of the page more. So just toning the whole page, I need to alternate my marks though, so they're, they're starting to build up a little bit. And I'm intentionally letting this hand kind of rub across the surface while I'm blending, so then it's actually smoothing out this area here. Uh, and I'm gonna use the palm to spread that out because I'm, I don't wanna stop and grab the paper towel. Uh, and I don't wanna use my oily fingers if I use the palm, it works out a little bit better. And I'm not worried about, you know, a pristine surface with at this stage. Um, this is all going to get messed up throughout the drawing. So now if I start with this tone, this is essentially going to become my sky tone and will erase out some of those cloud forms and some of the lighter values. And now I want to um, start to think through the basic composition. Again, using the side of the pencil. And I'm going to be thinking about this in terms of mass rather than line. Uh, we talked about that last week when we did the Degas um, copy is that provided a nice opportunity to really emphasize a, a linear approach to drawing. So we're kind of switching gears and focusing on building up masses and values. 
Uh, and I just want to first see how this all might lay out. Um, so, bad moments go. This is from where you are. That's awesome. I thought it was a Scottish castle, but I wasn't sure, and I didn't want to make a fool out of myself. So, <laughs> um, I believe the name of the castle is included in the title. Um, I am very jealous that you live in a place where this can exist. Um, all right, so I'm just kind of, again, just kind of blocking in. A lot of this has to do with, it has more to do with my mind than really anything that's happening on the page. You know, we, we talk about that a lot in this show, kind of starting off the, with these gestural marks um, helps to ground me um, and just connect me to the materials a little bit. Um, and, and, and if you're new, you know, the way, the way I conceive of this whole process is that I want the drawing to evolve in parallel with my understanding of the subject. And what I mean by that is when I'm looking at the subject, I instantly recognize it as castle ruins, but I don't have a deep knowledge and understanding of it. I haven't taken time to thoroughly examine the play of light and shadow, the proportions of this, the, the textures, uh, the value relationships between them, um, you know, the, the scale of the stones, the, the, the scale of that distant mountain. There's so much about it that, again, I, my, my subconscious brain is solving for me and just sending to my conscious mind castle ruins, right? And so now throughout the drawing process, the, the act of drawing itself will help connect me to all of those, those visual cues that my brain is processing to come to that immediate interpretation of these castle ruins. So the drawing itself is going to start general because this aligns with how I really understand the, the, the castle. And the reason I like to think about it that way is that it, it helps me to offload some pressure to get it right, right out of the gate, um, to, to map out the drawing with precision and understanding when I don't really have that. I'm going to you know, be building an understanding of this subject throughout the whole process. So all right. And as you notice, as I've laid this out, I haven't even, I haven't placed the castle at all. And the reason I did that is that this, what we have here is this nice play between overlapping forms. We have this mountain here, and we have, that's in front of the sky. We have this hillside, which is in front of that mountain. We have the stone wall, which is in front of that. And then we have a foreground plane there. So we have these bands that are all that are progressing forward and advancing towards us in space. And then that castle wedges itself between these two forms. And this line here across that hillside is going to be helpful in managing the proportions of the castle itself. So um, it's going to require some work because now I'm going to have to erase this part out. But if I start with that castle and build the background around it, uh, what I run the risk of doing is fracturing that landscape and not making it really feel cohesive. So that's kind of my thinking there. But th again, that's just that's just my approach. Um, and it is not to mean that a different way of laying out your drawing or creating a gesture wouldn't work. Um, so, but I, again, this is why we're drawing together is then we can explore the different ways in which we initiate a drawing. Um, oh, uh, Tom Thomas, can we still upload last week's drawing? Yes, you can always upload drawings. So all the pages exist on the Artist Network site. You can find the section under video where it says drawing together. You'll find a list of all the episodes we've done and you can continually up upload images. So I see images coming in every day from lots of past episodes. And if you're new, that's part of this whole program is that you can share your work when you're done. There's a there's a um, link in the description below, and I pinned it to the top of the chat as well. So you can share your work on artistnetwork.com when you're done. So, um, all right. Ardvrick Castle in Scotland. Yes. Um, it's very cool. Um, all right. Sorry, I hear a call coming in, and it's distracting me right now. But... That's all right. So before now I lay in the castle, 
Um, I want to do a quick double check about the basic proportion. So I'm going to look at the ratio between the sky and the ground. And I'm going to do that through a comparative measuring technique. I often actually do some angle sighting at this point, but I'm going to, I'm going to actually look at the basic scale. So if you're new to this concept, what comparative measuring is, is it's comparing the scale of one object in the drawing to another. So in the reference image, there's a particular relationship between the height of this background mountain and uh, the height of that foreground. Um, and so for me to find that, I have this large reference up here on my left, closing one eye so it flattens my depth perception. And I'm aligning the top of my pencil with this top of this ridge on the reference. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm taking the height I'm sliding my finger down so that it aligns with the, the hillside here in that, that middle ground. So the top aligns with the top of the background mountain. My knuckle indicates this edge here. And this height on the pencil indicates that, that creates a, a scale, a, a measurement for the height of the background hill here. And so then I'm going to compare it to that foreground on the reference image. So I'm going to slide that down. And what I notice is that this distance here from the top of that mountain to that hillside, if I carry that down that, and lock that distance down, that would indicate kind of the bottom of the, uh, that, uh, that stone wall there, which actually seems to align with what I'm observing here. There's a slight incline. So, um, I've kind of divided it up in thirds there with just a little bit more exposed at the bottom. And you can ask yourself as you, uh, you know, initiate your drawing, how accurate does this need to be? Is this, is this an impression of the subject or is this an accurate kind of photographic representation? Uh, and we're each going to have a an individual um, kind of balance of the two, and you may want to be expressive one day and and very detailed and realistic on another day. Uh, and but it can be helpful when you start the drawing to have that kind of defined for you as you're moving forward, um, so that it's you don't end up with a disjointed drawing where maybe you're doing some areas that are kind of loose and expressive and the proportions are all off and then some areas that is you're really hammering to try to get right and or if you do want to have some areas that are in higher focus than others start to think ahead where you want to bring that into focus and do you want to have the whole drawing brought up at the same time with with the same kind of equal distribution of detail or do you want to balance that i i kind of i think what i want to do here is because that castle is such a strong form, I want to really render that accurately and with a bit more precision. But I don't think I need to put as much into the um, into that stone wall. That's something that my mind just kind of naturally crosses over because that castle is such a strong focal point. And so I, I want my drawing to reflect what's happening when I actually observe the reference. So. Um, by so I'm going to prioritize the um, I'm going to kind of prioritize the castle and just suggest this the foreground stone wall. Okay, so now I'm going to get into now that I have just these basic proportions, I'm going to get into some angle sighting. Uh, so what I want to do is is really really try to find an average for these angles that I'm seeing here, and to help me do that, I'm going to close one eye again and use my pencil aligning it with a targeted angle like the back at uh, the top ridge of that mountain, locking my wrist, and then placing it directly on top of my drawing. Um, and when I'm, what I just did there, I have a drawing directly in front of me. I'm seeing what you're seeing because that, that overhead camera is capturing it. And so I can take that angle and visualize how the angle I'm marking on the reference um, correlates with what I have on the uh, on my drawing. Actually, I need to switch because this arm gets in the way. So, um, and I think I need to kind of level this out. So I'm just trying to visualize the, the average angle, not observe the, uh, not observe all the little, you know, dips and bumps and valleys in those curves. 
And actually, it looks like just my initial reaction captured these general angles pretty well. Um, I'm going to do a quick check-in on the overall composition at this point. Uh, what I am, what I'm looking for, are these intersections here. Uh, on the, the way these forms are exiting the page. There's really not much exiting the bottom. Uh, so I'm going to actually emphasize this little tuft of grass here because that helps to break up this edge. Um, and I might, uh, you know, I might put a little bit of detail down in here just so I have a few more forms that exit the bottom. But really, this is a horizontal form. Um, when you look at the scale relationship between these forms, the way they're, the way they're dividing um, the left and the right sides, I'm looking for something that doesn't feel consistent, kind of evenly spaced, because that's going to help, that's going to flatten things. What's going to help create depth is that there's some variability. So we're going from large to small to kind of medium to small again. Um, and then by, by breaking this up so that it's perhaps not the same proportions on left and right, it, it's going to help to create some more variation and create more depth. You know, if, if this black band was the same height as this, then it could be problematic. Um, and this is where you might fudge things a little bit um, it, from your reference. If you end up, if I were out on location and I was observing that these dark forms are creating kind of uh, replicated bands of value, I might try to drop down or lift up, try to change that relationship, get closer to the wall maybe to make that bigger than this or step farther back um, and play around with that until I find a spot that, that really creates that variety that's going to work with me when I'm trying to create the depth and, and lead to a more interesting composition. Um, yeah, and he is saying yeah, some people use um, charcoal powder or charcoal dust with a brush to get smooth surfaces. Um, I think that's a totally fine method. I don't, that's not something that I do. I just, the idea of a smooth surface doesn't particularly appeal to my sensibility. Um, but I've also adapted in my marks to incorporate some of that unevenness, right? I don't, I don't have a um, kind of a sensibility in my mark making that is really ultimately about precision. And so if you are more of a precise artist, then you might find that using powder to, to really create a smooth surface works with that, and you're not kind of fighting against it. Um, um, let's see. Okay, so now I want to uh, figure out the, the placement of that castle, and I think the first thing I want to do is I'm going to use that same measurement, the height of the hill from here, and there's a, what you'll notice is there's a bit of a notch in this foreground hill, and then you have that that back ridge. If I create that height, I can compare it to the lateral distance from the left edge to the edge of the castle. So I'm going to use my, I'm going to find that distance on the reference, turn. And what I observe on the reference photos, if I take this as a distance, um, the left edge of the castle is, is greater than that, that distance that I'm measuring. There's, it's that, there's that distance plus a little bit more. So then that puts the edge of the castle somewhere right around here. The, that round part kind of extends just above the edge of that, the, the ridge line there. And now I'm going to take that same distance, compare it. So then what I can do is actually I can take this distance here now, which is longer than this distance, carry that across, and the, that dark shadow on that crumbling wall, it's just a little bit, a little bit past that distance here. Actually, maybe perhaps a little bit too much. I'm going to rough in that, that shadow. So now I've given myself some parameters here. Uh, now I can measure vertically. There's, there's two different um, techniques that you can use to really kind of lock on the vertical height. Because what you're looking for is the proper relationship between the, hor the, the horizontal measurement and the vertical measurement. So I can take this measurement on the reference um, and I can compare it to the height. So I'm going to try that. One, and that's about one and a half. 
It's about one and a half times taller than it is wide um, based on the, um, that's right there, based on uh, the, you know, the, the, the marks that I'm seeing here, the dark shapes that I'm seeing. Um, and then I can double check that by now visualizing a diagonal across here. And now I can angle sight for that. And this, that's, again, it's just a double, uh, another way to kind of double check the ratio between the height and the width. And what I'm seeing is that something is off. Maybe I just, maybe I had rotated my wrist. Actually, yeah, it looks like it's pretty well right on. I might have to adjust this as we go on though. So right now I'm recognizing that this is just a general mark indicating the top of the castle. Now to help me with that, before I start mapping out the, the forms, I'm gonna continue to think about this as an abstraction just looking at shapes of light and dark. So squinting my eyes, actually closing my eyes and squinting helps to, closing one eye and squinting helps me to see the shapes. And if you can, try to trick yourself into just thinking of this as just shapes, these blobs of light and dark, not a castle. Um, because what can happen is that as soon as we identify an object and label it with a word, we start to project onto that all of our experiences with that subject. Um, you know, I've never seen this specific castle before, but I know when I was younger, I would draw this stuff all the time. And so there is a muscle memory, there's an understanding of how to draw a castle that's been built up throughout most of my life. And if I if I identify with that, that muscle memory, then I stop looking at the subject as much as I need to. Um, and there's a, there's a potential for this to really become the memory of past drawings, not the immediate experience of looking at this subject. So um, by trying to you know, remove the labels and the definitions of these subjects, you... Um, and, and try to observe them as simple abstractions, and shapes that are in relationship to one another, it helps me to, um, it, it helps me to see this castle for what it is and not, again, projecting something onto it based on my past experience. All right. Um, Yeah, Jane is pointing out that there is some perspective going back on the stone wall on the right side. You have it going more straight across. No, exactly. Yeah, I think it should kind of decline there. So those are really good observations. Uh, feel free to keep throwing those out because um, then it'll help bring me back to kind of correcting those. Um, so at this point, you know, I think that, you know, what we're looking at is this general shape and it really does start to kind of um, kind of pinch towards this side. Again, if we're thinking about it as an abstraction, um, just as a, a shape and trying to just lock onto that shape, what is happening there? And I'm also not worried about my hatch mark showing here because there's so much texture in this wall. There's a good chance that the marks that I'm making here are going to serve me when I need to um, suggest the texture a little bit more. All right, let me smooth this out with a paper towel. That's my favorite part <laughs> the whole drawing is, you know, building it up and then taking it down and then building it up again and then taking it down. Um, what, what I think about when I'm doing this is not, it's not just smoothing the surface, but unifying all the marks. Um, and, you know, what really so much of what happens in the drawing process is that we're balancing um, the variety with unity. So what I mean by that is every time we make a mark on the page, we're creating a division. Um, we're, we're breaking the unity of the white surface. Um, every time you do that, it becomes more exciting. But we also, um, it moves towards visual confusion. So if there's too much division, if there's too much contrast, then it can become difficult for the viewer to make sense of it. If there's too much unity, if there's not enough contrast, then it becomes boring. Um, and, and it may not um, really express what you're looking to express. 
Uh, so we, we're kind of looking for that balance. All right. And so I'm recognizing there's going to be some areas that I need to lighten with. Uh, I'll have to do some subtractive drawing. This approach to drawing is really kind of painterly in that this is how I might kind of approach a approach a painting. Blocking in shapes and gradually moving towards refinement. Um, all right, now I'm seeing like these sky holes here, but I'm gonna ignore them. I'll erase those out later. And as the layers of graphite build, um, the the subsequent layers just get softer and they accept it a bit more easily. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to lift the sky here, do some subtractive drawing, and I'm using the kneaded eraser on purpose, It's just a little bit gentler. So kind of leaning in on it if I need to lift up more. Uh, but, you know, and then really, you know, lightening and lifting if I, if I've lift, if I uh, just need to pull up a little bit. Um, I want to play with the composition a little bit. This is something I do with clouds. So since clouds are generally constantly moving, um, I don't worry about locking them in precisely unless the reference or unless when I'm out in the landscape, unless it's really serving the composition. I think clouds are a great way to really enhance the composition. So what I'm looking at are the angles of the clouds relative to the focal point, which is this castle. So I've got these strong verticals here. I've got these diagonals. What I think would actually work really well to help break up the space, push the clouds back, is to kind of reflect this angle here. This, there's this general... Um, kind of thrust in the in the castle that runs about this way. If I reflect that, that creates these clouds that kind of lift upward a little bit. And what I but what I just did there is I brought that right into the notch of that castle. And right away I can say that's not going to help me. That creates what's called a tangent. And when you have a tangent is when you have two forms that are in very different places, distances from one another. But because of your point of view, they appear to align at a single point. So a cloud that might be several miles away kind of aligns with this intersection here in the castle. And that's going to flatten things out. Uh, so to get rid of that tangent, I'm going to bring this over. Still think about the reflection of that, of that general angle. But I'm going to create a clear overlap with that. Um, and now I've got this big expanse here. One of the things I like is that in these clouds, there's kind of a crisscrossing. And there's a bit of almost perspective here. You can almost envision a vanishing point off to the right. And there are these, you know, striations that kind of lead off towards that. So they get more horizontal over here. And they become more um, angled as we move across the page. Now I'm letting these eraser marks go, they're kind of crossing over these forms. So I want a nice clean overlap and then I can build these forms now on top of it. So it's like we're, we're kind of pushing back and forth, laying the marks down, erasing, kind of cutting into them, putting another mark on, for, on top of that and maybe cutting that back out. So we're really um, you know, playing with that, that relationship between additive processes and subtractive processes here. And I want this to kind of lighten up a little bit more. Now, I, I'm expecting also that this is all going to get messed up <laughs> throughout the process. I'll probably have to do this work on the sky area multiple times. Okay. 
Heather is saying, Scott, I have used Bristol vellum paper, or have you used Bristol vellum paper? It's really interesting how it reacts with graphite and a charcoal, kind of having a tough time working with it. I, it's been a long time, and my immediate reaction, if somebody were to say, here's a sheet of Bristol or vellum paper, draw with it, I would get a little tightness in my chest. <laughs> because I just remember it being challenging to work with. Um, if I remember correctly, it tended to like grab the charcoal a little bit more. It's a smoother surface, but it almost feels like it, it would embed a bit more. In, and um, so there may you may need to be a bit gentle with it, and you may need to be a bit more protective over some of those light areas. What I like about the rag paper is that when you're erasing, you're often actually lifting particles of the paper off of that surface so that you can get down to a brighter white. And I don't know as if that's really possible with the vellum. So I think that's my, the, my, my thought about it. But again, I don't really work with it enough to know. So if anybody out there uses Bristol or vellum paper uh, with regularity and have any suggestions for working on it, that would be a great thing to help uh, Heather with. So, um, And then have I used the 500 Strathmore... Um, paper, yes, I believe. I've definitely worked with the Strathmore charcoal paper, and I believe it was the 500. That, that worked out really well for me. Um, the What will often happen uh, with, uh, you know, a rag paper is made with cotton rag fibers versus other papers that might be a wood pulp. And in order, so this has kind of has a natural tooth to it just because of the way it's made. You're, you're, you're creating this mash of water and, and cotton and it's, you're, you're filtering it out. Um, you know, you're, it's mixed with water. You're filtering that out and it forms this nice kind of soft sheet that has this natural tooth to it. When you're working with a wood pulp, you often have to kind of create that texture. So like a laid paper is created with a, by the, the mesh um, of the screen that is being created and that that creates these little ridges in the paper. Um, and often that has kind of a regularity to the tooth. Um, and that can actually be really interesting in some cases. So I find that when, I, when I'm using that to my advantage, that's when it tends to work out best. Um, and then some papers have a stronger, kind of deeper tooth to it that can be harder to work with. Um, but that tooth is really essential because that actually what holds on to the, the dust. And then I often find that that actually releases the charcoal pretty well. If I remember correctly, that Strathmore 500 does release it when you're erasing pretty well. So that's what I look for is, is that balance between the tooth holding it and the ability to lift with the eraser. Um, and then Tom teaches, my eyes want to see a curve on the bottom of the tallest stack of the ruins. Yes, there's this kind of curve here. Um, and then there's a slight cylindrical nature to this top form here. And then there's some nice structure here that we'll get into as well. Um, yeah, this is, re this is really cool to be able to see that cylindrical tower with this um, kind of cubic uh, form on top of it. Uh, one of the other things that I liked about this reference image is the play between the light and dark um, relationships. So I can lift this here now, and I'll kind of talk about that. So what we have in this section here is this alternating um, relationship where the sky is lighter than this, uh, this is darker than that, this is lighter than that, and then we have dark to light to dark, or darker to lighter to darker. So again, just thinking about the relationships between them. Um, I think in an absolute, this might be slightly darker in value here than here. So um, might start to think through that. And then, of course, we have darker here. So we have light a little bit darker, and this becomes light against this darker form, then light to dark to light. So we have this really nice relationship between them that will hopefully um, help to describe the, the form and structure of the, the castle here. Yeah, uh, Romero is saying Strathmore 500 is very versatile, pencil, charcoal, colored pencil. That, yeah, that's awesome. I, I do believe that's the case. I just, I don't remember names very well. Like I had to write the Pesha paper on this paper before the show so that I can remember it. <laughs> so, um, uh, 
it, it's, it's like ice skating on smooth ice and then running into <laughs> a dink and falling with charcoal and bristle. <laughs> That's really a funny, funny way to describe it. I, I get where you're coming from, Mo. Yeah, there's something about the smoothness. Um, that's why I have a hard time actually drawing on tablets. Um, I don't have a lot of experience, but the first thing I notice is that there's no real resistance, and I love the resistance on paper um, and really feeling that that play between them. You know what's cool is we have special sensors in our fingertips that that telegraph texture as vibrations through a surface so that when you're drawing, you're, you, have, you have an understanding of the surface of the paper through your fingertips, right? which is really cool. It'd be like you know driving, you're holding onto the steering wheel, you can tell what the texture of the road is. You know you can visualize the gravel or the, or the, the pavement or the, the concrete that you're driving on because of those vibrations and because of those specialized sensors. And so to me, that's one, one of the reasons why I gravitate towards national, natural or traditional, I'm sorry, um, drawing methods, even though I keep really wanting to do digital art because it looks awesome. Um, and I see some amazing things being put out there, but I'm, I need to put myself out there, I think, a little bit more and um, experiment with it. Okay, now what am I doing? Oh, Stephanie, your family ruin is Scarborough Castle. In the UK, yeah, we've got family castles as well. The there's a Goodrich Castle in our family that I really would love to go see. So, um, let's see. All right, I see and everything. I'm not seeing any. Okay, Mars Lumograph graphite works well on Bristol. It's more of an oily graphite. Oh, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to to recognize as well is that the material you're using could uh, vary. Okay. Um, back to this, I want to, what do I want to do? I want to focus on basic value relationships and then, then I'm going to refine these forms. So what I'm observing is right now I have this value relationship here that I'm actually kind of liking, but there's not enough separation between this distant mountain and that. Um, and so I think I need to darken this, just kind of blocking it in so I'm not uh, I'm not refining that shape until I have a, a, a kind of a general understanding of the basic value relationships. So I'm going to darken that, and I want to make sure there's a feeling of continuity between the left and the right sides of this distant mountain now that it's been broken by the castle. And you can see right here, I'm going right over that edge. I'm not being precious with that edge, because so I can cut that back out later. And as I reflect on it, I look up and I can see it. I, I was worried that there would not be enough contrast between these two, but I'm still able to see that shadow. And now this, I'm going to, again, darken. But I'm not, again, I'm not really worried about refining that shape. Just want to get these basic value relationships. See how that feels. And I like that. I'm going to drop in another cloud there. It's just one of the one of the things that I like to emphasize are just really clean overlaps. It's such a great way to create depth. You know, there's no, multiple tools that we have at our disposal to create depth in your work. You have, you know, really the three things are you have overlapping form. I'm sorry, four. Uh, overlapping form, scale, um, you have linear perspective, and then you have atmospheric perspective. Um, and for me, overlapping form really is an important one. Um, and in particular, looking at the point of intersections with forms that overlap. Um, so for example, there's a kind of a landmark here on the castle. There's this little shadow here. Um, and then there's a bit of a gap here with the sky, and then the ridge forms. So you've got a bit of a staggering here. 
if this hill line aligned with this, we get a, another tangent, which is just going to flatten things out. Um, you know, we already have, you know, we're, we already have a disadvantage in terms of creating depth because we're literally working on a flat piece of paper. We're trying to create the illusion of depth here. So we have to use all the tools at our disposal to make that happen. Or if that's your goal is to make depth, that is. Um, but so just kind of be aware of those tangents and repeated patterns, things like that, and make sure that you're you're moving forward with consciousness. Because there was definitely a time for years when I I was really attracted to those tangents and the and the idea of emphasizing the flatness of the surface um, to to not try to like, to try to create depth through color relationships um, and value um, and, and and intentionally create ta uh, tangents that flatten the space. So uh, I just want to kind of put that out there that you know we 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 don't have to if. I can, I can say you want to create depth, but that may not be what you want to do. There is no absolute rule here that every, every drawing has to have a strong sense of depth. I think there are some things that can be very interesting when they, they don't follow the rules. Um, so, but if your goal is to create depth, look at those, those tangents there and look for those. Um, yes, and Stephanie's saying the core shadow um, tells us a tower is a cylinder. So we'll get into that. We'll talk about... Um, the light side, shadow side, we'll talk about the form shadow there. We see a bit of a cast shadow here and shadow shapes as well. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, it's a really good reminder. And when we get into that shadow side, we can talk about how to really create that sense of volume when we don't have a lot of information available to us. This bottom of the cylinder is obscured and then the top is essentially at eye level. So it's, it's appearing to be flat. So it's this transition it's that gradient that is really all we have to identify it as a cylinder. So that becomes really critical. Um, okay. What am I doing? All right. I'm going to work background forward. I'm going to smooth this out a little bit. Just a light pressure with a paper towel. Again, going right over that edge. Um, overall value is working out pretty well. And then what I'm going to do is just kind of refine the profile of this hill and um, I'm just going to move through this quickly I I could um, I'm not going to really be all that concerned with matching it one to one um, compositionally though right now it's a bit problematic because I feel like I have these regular bumps so what I want to I want to um, emphasize is an irregularity. So create some variety there. I'm going to carry this across and do the same. Yeah, I just don't, I don't want like these evenly repeated forms. Uh, there's a bit of shadow here. So I'm just using the side of the pencil to suggest the uh, kind of structure to that hillside, looking for basic shadow shapes. And one of the, the techniques that I like to use to suggest those shadow shapes is um, to observe the path that I need to follow and then run marks that are kind of perpendicular to that path. So you see these these lines, this kind of the striations there in the landscape, kind of visualize that horizontal path, but create it as a series of kind of vertical dashes that follow along that path. And again, look for some variety there in your marks. Just going to suggest them and then just evaluate does it. Does it convey a sense of light and shadow now? Now I realize that it's getting you know, really muddied here, so this is going to have to get quite a bit darker, but I have a darker um, graphite that I can be using. So I'm going to let that be for now. Um, there's some structure to this hill down here that is all very subtle, the way the light's blasting that side of that, that mountainside there. It's a, it's a challenge, but it does get dark right in here. So I'm going to 
and apply a little bit of a gradient there. So uh, this is going to be another tool for us to create a sense of depth. This vertical edge is all light. I don't see a lot of variation in the value from top to bottom, but there are some subtle variations in the mountainside next to it. So what that means is that relationship between the mountain and that cylinder is constantly changing as we move up and down that edge. And I might kind of emphasize that or amplify that just a little bit. So I'm just looking, you know, similar to what we talked about with our composition and the way these forms exit the right side of the, of the page. Um, I'm thinking about that here. Now we can apply that same logic where we're looking at some variety in the spacing and the shapes that interact with this vertical edge. So we have this kind of soft gradient, kind of a, a blotchier form here, a more concrete line edge, and then there's that line there. And now I can come in and use my um, kind of sharpened eraser to refine this edge. Kind of create a sharpness along there. Clean that up. Okay. Uh, Tom teaches, do I use Blender for digital art? I do not. Um, I have spent very little time working digital art, mostly just stuff on an iPad. Um, yeah, and he is saying a really good comment. There are so many new supplies in art stores that I get pretty overwhelmed going there. I like to go in knowing exactly what I want and need. Otherwise, I get easily distracted or confused. It certainly gets overwhelming. And I know um, the materials we use can ultimately be kind of habitual in nature. Um, I know for myself, I would often, you know, I, you know, I started out kind of experimenting, you know, based on what other people recommended, other, you know, students or professors. Um, but then, you know, I would, you know, some materials I'd have more success with than others. And it's often the, the materials that, uh, you know, that we're using when we, we feel like we've had a successful um, experience that we tend to go back to. We attribute the success to those materials. And then once we find that success, it's really hard to break it. But um, I also get bored very easily, and I'm constantly adjusting my palette uh, when I'm painting just to try to new, find new color combinations. Um, so just lifting a little bit of, of light along here so instead of drawing a line here with the eraser or subtracting that line, I'm ex observing that path, but creating it through a series of these shorter, straighter marks. And now I can kind of lift over. Actually, I want to It's a very subtle relationship, but I want to make sure that we capture that. Um, uh, Mad Moments Go, that sounds awesome about your painting of the castle. Um, so right now the pencil I'm using is this General's Kimberly. It's a 6B. That's what I've been using for almost all of this drawing. Um, actually, what I want to do is I want to provide a little bit more context to, the, uh, to that landscape and then come into that castle. So I want to... I'm just going to look for these shadow shapes. And using the side of the pencil, I forgot to mention that you know part of the process when I'm using the side of the pencil is to continually rotate it as I'm going um, to keep that fairly cylindrical and prevent myself from getting a flat edge. And and also you know you can see that it, this this has got many planes on it, and that leads to a certain amount of irregularity. There are some things that are kind of out of my control, and I like that, especially when I'm trying to suggest shadow shapes because in nature there are very rarely any um, you know, clear rectangular forms or geometric forms. And so by, um, by intentionally creating a, a pencil that is, is not a precise conical form, it gives me the opportunity to create kind of some un unexpected and unplanned shapes. So I'm just thinking about overall shadow shapes. Um, also, um, 
I'm paying attention to where I am in relationship to the whole. I am not really measuring where I'm at, but I'm, I want to make sure I'm generally working in the right area because it's so easy to get kind of sucked in, into and absorbed into the the mark making in one area and forget to kind of double check, you know, where we are. I also want to be aware of kind of cross contour. What is the structure of this hill and how can I orient my marks in a way that reinforces that structure? Uh, many of you reached out after the Degas copy and suggested Van Gogh as uh, somebody that we copy. So I did find a reference. So um, uh, coming up in the next couple months, we'll be doing a, uh, a Van Gogh copy. But he is somebody that I observed really emphasizes cross contour marks to reinforce the volume of a form. He gets very direct with those marks. And then over here, there's this really, really interesting rock that I think balances the castle nicely. It helps to anchor this side of the page. And it casts a little shadow across the ground there. And then I, ha I haven't, you know, I haven't lifted out the highlight there, so I'm just focusing on those shadow shapes. Building from the shadows first. Um, what I kind of observe in the, the general direction of these shadow forms is kind of two directions that I could be using for my cross contour. These marks that come down this way and then marks that curl back that way. It reminds me of you know, one of the things we, we talked about in several episodes ago, you know, as I try to think about what are, you know, if I, if I, if I were to try to teach drawing and I could give somebody only two kind of words of wisdom, what I think are really essential that would really help to move the drawing, um, I've been really contemplating if it would be valuable to just focus on what's the shape and what direction do I need to make the marks. Uh, and then from that, it can build into um, an understanding of a lot of different aspects of your subject. If you just study the shape and think about what direction you want those marks to go. I don't know if I really believe that entirely, but it's something that I'm kind of toying in my, with in my mind. Okay. I'm going to... And so in something like this, I'm going to pop that, that edge forward by dropping some little marks on there. If I zoom in, I can't quite go across. Oh, no, wrong way. There we go. That's a bit better, a little bit brighter. But I want to kind of sharpen up this edge, not by drawing a line, but observing the path and dropping some of these just little suggestions that, um, that might illustrate the, uh, the way that edge feels. If I come down here, I can do the same. So just using very small kind of value relationships And I can, well, maybe, well, maybe I'll let me zoom back out. I'm going to lock that down a little bit. I'm going to just erase out some of the, the light on these rocks here. Not being very precise. And that's okay. This is just a suggestion. Almost thinking about it like a field sketch. Um, if any of you are Artist Network members, um, you may have seen the announcement for the next Illuminate event. Illuminate is our program where we, we um, kind of spotlight an artist each month, and this artist 
is uh, Debbie Caspery, who um, does a lot of field studies, and she's got some really cool stories of, um, you know, sketching in jungles and in these wild places. And she's going to talk through a bit of her thought process when she's sketching in the field, what some of the tools she brings with her, and share her experience. That'll be next Tuesday. So it's an artist talk with some demonstration as well. Um, but, you know, I think I find it really fascinating. And I'm, I'm just trying to, it, it's just kind of it's something that I'm thinking about here because I'm trying to imagine if I were on location here, which would be awesome. Um, what would it be like? How much, you know, if I don't have a whole lot of time, how could I capture the essence of this experience? Okay. So let me come I'll come in here, tighten up a little bit so you can see more closely what I'm doing. Um, let's see. Uh, good question here. As a newbie, I'd love to know what are your go-to graphite grades for landscape and portrait? You know, I'm, th these are all relatively soft. So the hardest one that I have right now is an H. Um, then I have my 6B, uh, and then I have this extra black. If I had, if I could only use one pencil, I think a regular yellow number two is actually really awesome. That's, a fair, you know, it's kind of middle of the range. An ebony pencil, um, my Prismacolor works really well. That's very soft. Um, and then I really like this set. This is a Cezanne um, set of pencils that have, the hardest it has is the 2H, and it goes all the way up to a 12B. And you can see that <laughs> I'm missing some of these here, but um, you just looking at the height of these pencils here, my 12B is almost worn down because I use it so much. I just really like the softer, darker ones. Um, but that's really just kind of my preference based on my my approach to drawing. Um, so I, I think for, for you, if you're just starting out, try to get a variety. But I do think it's important to, to have something that gets really dark. Because what happens, and we can talk about that here in the context of this drawing, is, is value is understood in our minds as a relationship. We don't have the ability to interpret a value in isolation. You know, it's like somebody who has perfect pitch can hear the frequency of a note and identify it as an E or an A or C or whatever. And they can do that outside of the context of a, of a chord progression or scale progression. With, with graphite or with values, our brains just don't have that that, that potential, the way our visual system works and the way our retinas interpret visual information is that it's looking at the relationship between them. And as such, we're always calibrating our impression of a value based on the relationship between them. So as we look at this, for example, what will happen is we will identify this and we'll label it subconsciously as black. We're going to look at the darkest dark and just we're going to assign that black. We'll look at the lightest light and assign that white. The reality is there's no white and there's no black here. We're in this really middle gray. And then as we build up more values, it changes our interpretation of them. All of a sudden, this becomes lighter. That becomes darker. Um, and as we erase some of this a bit more and we lift the values, by contrast, it's making the darks feel darker. So um, I think it's really helpful when you're starting to draw with graphite to have an ex as expansive of a range as possible, especially towards the dark, because you already have your lightest light with the white of the paper. Just know how dark you can go with your graphite and let that guide your decisions when you're choosing your pencils. Um, Often what we'll do is we'll default to choosing the pencil that gives us the most control. And this happened to me so much when I was starting out. I would create a drawing that I loved. I'd be working up close and I'd have all this fine detail. I'd get it dialed in. I'd step back from it and I could barely see it. Because up close, you can see all of that. You don't need contrast to interpret edges and forms. But you do need that contrast from a distance. Um, and that when I really started to understand that when I was you know, first starting out, that, that really helped me uh, dial in a value range of the materials I'm working with. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I think especially with something like a portrait, having an expansive range can be really valuable so that it really pulls somebody into the subject from a distance. So, all right, Nia, glad you're going to be there for the Illuminate event. Um, 
Uh, so, uh, Jay, Kath, I hope that helped answer your question. Um, do I have uh, Sunflower Cherry saying, have, hey, got another question. Do you have... Uh, do you have any landscape drawing in graphite pencil? Another, oh yeah, I'd, well yeah, so this is in graphite. I don't do a lot of drawing landscapes on plein air. I, I typically paint, um, but I'll often do some sketches um, to help think up through a composition when I'm in the field. And uh, that is often just graphite. I don't use charcoal or anything. All right, so. And then Deborah, yeah, this is a Derwent retractable eraser. Um, you can see I've used quite a bit of it now. Um, and I have this, I use the razor blade to cut this down to that chisel tip. Uh, and then Tom Teach, so 12B is the darkest, yeah. So the higher you go in the B num uh, letters, they use an alphanumeric system to grade pencils, the higher you go up the B scale, the softer and darker it is. And towards the H's, the higher you go there, the harder it is. So what the way graphite pencils are made is, you know, graphite is, you know, mined from the earth. It's ground into a powder. And then f in order for it to form into the core of a pencil, it needs some sort of binder. Uh, and I don't know specifically what that is, but it's a clay-like binder. Um, and so what you're getting with, with the graphite pencils, it's the same graphite in all of those pencils. What's changing is the ratio of graphite to that medium. So it, the, it becomes harder the more of that clay medium you mix into it. There's less graphite, so it creates a harder, more precise, yet lighter valued mark. Uh, the more, the higher you go up the the B value, so up to the twelve B, then you're looking at closer to just the pure graphite powder, which can get kind of as dark as it's you know possible out of graphite. So, all right. So as I'm looking at this, I see observe this small light there. Um, I'm just going to slightly indicate that edge, and I want I want to imply that a little bit more then make it explicit. So this right now is that General's extra black, so it's close to that 12B. I don't know specifically what grade it would be in that alphanumeric scale. Um, but you see, uh, uh, the way I'm, I'm going to indicate the kind of the structure here is I still want to be thinking about it in terms of shape rather than line. So the way I'm using the side of the pencil is I'm trying to be aware of when I'm engaging the, the the pure side of it, I'm laying it flat. As I roll up, it engages the tip, which gives me a little bit more precision. So I'm kind of starting in the center of this shadow form and working my way across. Um, if I map the shadow shape with a line and then fill it in, and I have... I run the risk of that line becoming too vis you know, creating a visual separation that won't read as a shadow quite as readily. As I come up to this edge, if I needed to be sharper, I can just roll my my wrist a little bit to get that harder edge. And I'm just eyeballing the proportions. I'm off in some of these areas. That's, and I'm gonna just say that's okay because that's what I want. You may not want that. I just I want to make sure I'm being mindful of everybody everybody's time. Yes, uh, uh, Saman Kucher, the thumbnail is a drawing. I did do a version of this. Oh, that's what that was what question you had. So. So yeah, this is my initial version here. So I do a preparatory drawing so that we have a thumbnail. And it also helps me to think through the value of this subject. Um, I have abandoned subjects before after doing a preparatory drawing um, just because I, I felt like it may not be as helpful as perhaps something else. Um, so when I'm selecting the images, I'm trying to think through what, um, what is going to advance our skills the most. So I looked at hundreds of photos of castles, 
And I settled on this one because of that light and value structure. Uh, and I felt like that's going to give us something really um, kind of concrete to latch on to. The other images that I found just had problematic uh, lighting structures. All right, so there's this little sky hole here. And I can refine. There's another one right here. So when I'm, when I'm thinking about those sky holes, I'm, I'm intentionally erasing more than I need and then cutting back into it, trying to observe that specific shape. That was a good question. Thank you. Um, and then coming up here. Uh, as I'm doing this, I think it's important to keep in mind that you want to be um, comparing your your place your, your orientation to other parts in the drawing. So as I'm as I'm trying to calculate, say the top part of this this part of the drawing, I'm looking at how it relates to these other forms. So I'm doing a quick check in, um, you know, comparing vertically like this with a, an implied plumb line, and then laterally like this with an implied and a horizontal guide. Uh, so it's, I'm, but that's kind of happening all at once. Because it's so easy to just isolate my kind of mind on the, um, on the specific form, just get really sucked into this form and just moving down and lose sight of where we are relative to other parts of the castle. So um, just make sure that you're keeping an awareness on the relationship between your forms. And I'm going to adjust the shape of this a little bit um, through some of the subtractive drawing. And now I've got, I've got a bit of a problem with value relationships here. So as I look at the value of the sky, and I look at the value of this light on the that broken piece of castle, what I observe is that this, it's a little bit darker on the castle side here, but then it feels really light over here. So I need to be very subtle in this section. And actually what I'm going to do is just block in that value. And, you know, you saw me lift that value earlier, but let me see what happens if I block that in as a darker value than the sky. Can I create the impression that this part here is lighter, not by lifting with the eraser, but by darkening the shadow adjacent to it? And see how that reads. And if that's not quite enough, then I can, I can always lift with the eraser here, kind of pop that that edge. Hopefully that made sense. And I do want to kind of sharpen up some of these areas here. Um, it's a little bit darker on this inside edge of this wall. And I'm looking at the direction of my marks, I'm going to prioritize the vertical nature of these marks. And there's a blotchy kind of quality to my hatching here, which I think is actually working to create the texture. I'm trying to let the materials do the work. And then it's a little bit darker on this side. So what we, what we kind of see is we see this turn where it gets quite a bit darker here. And just a slight light value there gets dark in here. And there's like a corner piece in here where it gets deeper in value. I guess dark in here. Um, a little bit of a gradient here where that, that stone is broken. And then um, looking at value structure here, what we're also seeing is a bit of bounce light catching in here. 
So that means light in the environment, the sky all around it is, is reflecting in that shadow area to create some value contrast there. So I can actually use my finger to lift off some of that if I want to enhance that. So I said earlier that, you know, we're working these edges, um, you know, at both additively and subtractively. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Jane just bought new supplies. Those Create a Colors, uh, Create a Color pencils are really awesome. I really like those. Um, I have some here, but I, it's, that's one of those materials that I forget to pull out. I need to use those more. Yeah, those are really cool. All right, um, now this side here is a little bit flat. So while I'm up in this area, you can see how my hand's just getting all messed up. I'm not being very precious with this at all. So, and I, that's just part of my process. I know I'm gonna have to go back and clean some areas up. Um, uh, oh, and he's saying, would you consider teaching plein air techniques on YouTube in the future? Painting videos in real time are rare on YouTube. I would love to do that. Um, it's a challenge to do it on plein air because of bandwidth and, you know, just getting a, a good enough cell signal to be able to stream. But I do have a plein air video on Artist Network that just talks about some of my techniques. It's, it's a bit old now. I'd love to do a new one. Okay, what do I need to do? So just as I step back, there's just not enough value relationship between these. So I'm going to darken this, but I'm going to go switch to the H pencil and now to actually fill that in. And I've got the darkest dark here, so I want to sneak up on the values. Kind of change my marks up and and actually where it feels darkest, if you have a hard time seeing the value relationships, really squint your eyes. Um, that'll help with that. And what I what I see is this general darkening towards the outer corners. And actually, I think I need to kind of erase this back a little bit, shift that edge over. Uh, there's a just an interesting change in the in the light and shadow structure here, so. So just using the H pencil it makes ensures that I don't get too dark in the light areas. I want to create the, a distinction between the light and shadow sides. And as as you can see, I'm not drawing a straight line across here, um, you know, vertically up the side of that that castle wall. Um, I want it to be broken. That'll help to create a stronger sense of atmosphere. But there are some variations in the bricks that I'm going to suggest. And when I'm looking at, you know, the shapes of the stones on here, if I want to suggest that, rather than trying to create a line and outline it, I'm trying to observe those shapes and then create them with a hatching mark. And that kind of ensures that they don't pop off the shape, up off the form as distinct shapes, that these are part of that form. If we go overboard with texture, sometimes it can work against you by degrading the, the kind of the substrate, the form that's holding that texture together. And a lot of times, if you can create a sense of form and volume through light and shadow, it implies a texture that the viewer starts to fill in uh, naturally. And then I can also do that with the eraser here. Kind of suggest some of the lines, edges of the stones with the eraser. All right, let's see. All right. Um, and then Sketch uh, saying, I believe Faber-Castell has a set of matte finish pit graphite 
and I believe it goes to a 14B. Ooh, that's awesome. I really like the Faber Castell uh, pit as well. Really, I love all of these, <laughs> all of these materials, all of these companies. Um, there's so much good stuff going on in the art world. I feel grateful that we have art companies out there that really take the time to develop products that artists want to use. Um, and they're constantly innovating. It's one of the um, one of the perks to working here with Artist Network is that I can sometimes get to chat with you know people at these various companies, hear about what they're doing. All right, so I'm kind of refining this, you know, thinking both in terms of positive space and negative space here. Um, so I'm really using the shadow shape to define the shape of this light side of the wall. But as I move up into here against the sky, I'm shifting to uh, this H pencil a little bit harder to define that edge. And I'm not, I didn't really get that form quite right. That's okay. So now I need to ask myself, is it worth fixing? I'm like, no, I think it works okay. And that's because I want to move this thing along. <laughs> so I'm going to say you keep blowing the screen every time I use the eraser. That's awesome. Um, I'll try to keep that clean for you. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to work on this cylinder over here now. And so as you can see that I'm, I'm looking at this shadow form and I'm, I'm ignoring this edge here. What I want to get right is the, the transition in value. Remember what I said earlier is that we, we don't have a lot of information about the cylinder because the bottom, and the, the bottom is obscured and we're almost at eye level at the top. So really the only thing that helps us to really understand the cylindrical nature of this form is the fact that there is a gradation of value. If this was a hard edge, it would suggest to us that there's actually a right angle or close to a right angle there. Um, but because of that gradation, we know it to be a cylinder. So I'm working that transition. And what I want to do, I'm going to kind of blend it. I'm going to lift with the eraser. I want the lightest light to not be up against the edge, but maybe just set in a little bit from it. And now I have this kind of gradation and then a flat value here. So we, it's been a while since we've talked about light and shadow structure. There are three shadow terms that I think are really helpful to know. There's what's called a form shadow, a cast shadow, and a shadow shape. So the form shadow is really what we're utilizing here. That's the idea that they have a light side and a shadow side. A cast shadow is, is what it sounds like. It's the object that is casting a shadow onto another surface. And we see that a little bit in this area here where this wall is casting a dark shadow on that grassy landscape. And the shadow shape is the combination of the two. And again, we see that over here where we have the cast shadow and then we see the form shadow on that brick wall that can be merged together into one dark form. Um, within the sh shaded side of the form shadow, you often get what's called a, a bounce light or a reflected light in that shadow. Um, and you have what's called a shadow core. So here, where we, and we have light side and shadow side, there's what's called the line of termination or the terminator um, that you can see a little bit more easily when you squint your eyes. So you, can, you get a sense that it's right around here, right in the middle, where we're transitioning from it being in light to varying degrees to it being in shadow to varying degrees. In that shadow side, you'll have that shadow core where the shadow is the darkest. And it's often not right at the edge. It's often set in, um, you know, in the kind of in the middle of your form shadow there. And then often the bounce light kind of catches up along that edge. And so when I squint my eyes, though, there's there are things happening in this space that break that that structure. What I see happening is that it gets a little bit darker down in here. Uh, down in this corner, but then it feels like it gets darkest here, closer to that line of termination. So it's like the 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 
it perhaps is because of the sky is above, we're getting some bounce light in this area, but we're not getting as much in this corner. So we're, we're, we're not getting any bounce light in the corner, so that stays dark. But there is um, a slight reflected light um, here. Now, I'm, what I want to point out, though, is that I'm not erasing. I'm not lifting out that reflected light. I blocked in the value, and I'm creating the impression of that reflected light by darkening the shape around it, next to it, that shadow core next to it. It should be subtle. Um, if when it's overstated, what can happen is that you end up confusing the viewer and thinking that the light here is actually a highlight if it's too light. We want a clear distinction between light side and shadow side, and within that shadow side, subtle variations in value. So in no way would that reflected light be as bright as that highlight. Um, only in really kind of extreme lighting situations would that reflected light be as bright as the highlight, you know, then it would be actually a secondary highlight. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, and uh, as I'm working this, you know, this, the quality of this gradation says a lot about the surface. The sharper an edge between light and shadow, the smoother the surface, right? And you observe that in glass forms or mirrors, reflections, things like that. Um, the, the more broken that and more diffuse that, that value, that gradation, the more matte or, you know, the least reflective <laughs> of that. And because this is stone, it's not reflecting a lot of light. Um, and it's actually, it's an irregular surface where you get all of these bumps and grooves. So I'm using this horizontal orientation of my pencil to align with the generally horizontal nature of the stones, but then dropping the marks down as vertical marks to align with the vertical quality of them. It's a vertical wall. Um, you know, and if you were to be, if this were a brick wall, you might have much more distinct and repeated kind of patterns there. So I'm creating just these irregular marks that suggest the stones. And as I move into the light, really just lifting off and kind of trailing off a little bit to suggest that stone. Um, Deanne is saying, I have three electric, uh, only one works well. Yeah, I've, I had a, electric erasers for a while, but I, I just stopped using them. It's just the habit of using the non-electric ones. Okay. Um, Tom teaches. I do. I do describe the shadow structure in my book. That you know, again, I'll be coming out in June. Um, I don't know if I have it written anywhere else, though. Um, but what I want to do is, like, when I squint at the reference, there is greater similarity between the darks here and this, uh, the cylindrical part. So I'm going to create a value wash here, try to darken everything. Let's see how that feels. Actually, I kind of want to darken down in here a little bit more. And then what I'll, also what I need to be aware of is that this may not be actually getting darker down in that corner. It may feel darker as light catches more kind of st a stronger light in that corner. I wanted to say more strongly, and that didn't sound right, so then I get caught up in my words there. <laughs> um, ooh, 100-day art project. That sounds awesome, Jane. Um, Yeah, uh, believer keeper. Yeah, well, I'm going to continue to talk about the stones. I think as we, as we build this up, I'm mostly it really textures. So much of it is about light and shadow. Again, we can convey a lot of information about um, texture just through really understanding the transition between light and shadow. So I want to get that right and then add texture um, gradually. If I, again, it, for me, what's most important is to maintain that underlying structure because if, if we apply a texture on top of a weak structure, then it actually creates visual confusion for the viewer. Uh, so we are, in this, I'm trying to 
maintain that sense of structure, only adding texture in a way that hopefully contributes to the structure and not detracts from it. So I'm going to switch. Oh, actually, I have the pencil that I want. I want to indicate the shadow side here. So this is an interesting stretch um, as I'm working on the shadow because you're thinking both part in terms of positive space and negative space. You know, you've got the black forms being the, the positive space against the lighter landscape behind it. Um, but you're also forming a positive and negative spatial relationship against the light side of the of the castle here. So I'm trying to trying to observe both of those at the same time. I have to get those windows in. And this is really cool here where the that hillside integrates with a castle. It's, you know, it's like it's, it's become one with the landscape. There's a little band of light that we, we observe as it, you know, passes through some of the structures. Most likely what that indicates is actually some, there's an obscured opening an opening that's obscured from our view. So now we're down here where we have form shadow, and then this is that little cast shadow that merges with the form shadow of the building. And I love how here it kind of undercuts a little bit. And as we come down here, I can indicate this hole. So I'm going to start with a lighter pressure, not going as dark as I can. Try to find that shape, and then it looks like there's some kind of variation within that. I'm going to sharpen that edge. Um, and I'm just, I'm kind of eyeballing these forms. The main thing is that before I'm doing it, I'm doing a quick check-in where I am relative to some of these other forms. So how far to the right does this opening go? How close to this shadow does it get? Um, and trying to be aware of the scale of, you know, in this positive and negative spatial relationship, the scale of relationship between those two. Observe this distance here. Uh, I'm not going to measure it, but I want to at least eyeball it so there's an awareness there. I think it needs to get a little bit bigger. Um, and I do have, I have the small thumbnail in front of me and I have the larger one here. And I feel like actually rendering these holes is best achieved with the small thumbnail. Um, it, it just, I feel like I observe that shape as, as a distinct shape more clearly. Okay, so now let's work on that texture. Um, going to get some questions really quickly. Darks are light in the light and dark in the dark. If your reference image doesn't have enough shade and shadow to define them, make stuff up. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a... One of the things that I need to try to break, I think, a little bit is that I tend to adhere to the reference or the, the live landscape in front of me. And, and every artist has kind of a threshold in terms of what's acceptable in terms of making up things. Um, and... The, the trouble that I get into is when I'm out in the landscape, I think of it more like a portrait than anything. You know, I'm trying to capture that specific place. And a lot of times, and I think what makes a portrait work is really, a, you know, paying close attention to proportions. Um, and you know, especially kind of profiles, getting it right, because we, we are so sensitive to those things. 
Um, what that does, though, is it traps me into doing exactly what you're talking about, kind of pushing shadows and light to create the volumetric form that can be helpful for the painting. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of times where I end up with work that's just that's more flat than it needs to be because I'm I kind of hold on too tightly, making it look exactly what I'm looking at. And I don't think that serves me very well. So I'm saying that you got some good observations there, Stephanie. So um, you know, I think so much of drawing, the thing that I value in the drawing process and in painting as well is that it helps me to become aware of my what I bring to a, an environment and in, into an experience, what I'm projecting into it that may not be there. Because we all do that. You know, we, um, the way our visual system works is that we anticipate things. We, um, for the efficiency of our brain's energy systems, it's, it's, it's more expedient for us to essentially hallucinate and invent what we expect to see in the landscape and then reconcile that with the optical information um, it, rather than treating every experience as purely unique and unbiased. It, it, bias is inherent in the way we view things in this world, the way we experience things. We do that with taste and touch as well. Our anticipation of what we expect to experience out of a certain sense um, is is predicted by our brain and then again reconciled against the the um, the sensory data that we're taking in. And um, and so I love that drawing kind of does that. You know, we I realize, oh my gosh, I you know, it felt one way, or I, I saw it as one thing when it was actually something different. And we actually do that. Like we we will physically see something incorrectly because of some the way we we project into the, the landscape. And that's something we should be grateful for because it allows us our brains to function efficiently. But drawing and painting helps to just illuminate that, the, the biases we bring to it. Okay. Um, so as I'm working on the texture, I'm, I just talked about working on texture and I've said nothing about it. <laughs> um, so again, keep in mind what I said earlier. This is where the direction of your marks really plays a role. Now what I'm looking for are really these thin shadows uh, that help indicate cracks in the stones and trying to understand the general orientation of them. And so if there's a horizontally oriented shadow, I'm going to try to visualize the path it goes on to, but I'm going to create it by dropping vertical marks down. It reads more like a shadow that way than a, um, than a line. If I draw lines, then what happens? A line is, a line indicates the edge of something. Um, and it, you know, it, we, we tend to interpret lines as contours often. Um, and I don't want anything in the center of this form to read as a contour because it's not a contour. It's on the surface of that. If anything, I can drop lines in along the edges and it'll work out fine because that is, that is the contour of the form. So, um, but, and all, another thing that can help be helpful to do is really keep squinting at the, uh, at the form. The impulse when we're working with texture is to look harder and sharper focus. But what that does especially in the center of your focus, it prioritizes detail over value relationships. It actually heightens the value relationship from what it actually is. It's like our brain is doing that on purpose so that we can see the details with greater clarity. To really observe value relationships in those detail areas, look adjacent, focus adjacent to the area you're targeting. So in this case, you might put your focus here, but put your awareness here. Really pay attention to what's outside of the center of focus, and you'll see that value relationship more effectively. It's going to give you more information to use for that detail. Um, that's one of the reasons why you know often see work that is um, using detail in such a way that it just pops off the page. It degrades from the form because that's what happens when you look 
intently, really focus on something. Again, we when we're in that mode of looking closely at focus, it's all about understanding those details. And so we, st- we kind of create an inaccurate impression of those value relationships. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, in Photoshop, boosting the contrast and kind of blowing out the contrast in something, you're going to see those edges more clearly. Our brain is kind of doing that all, on its own. Um, you know, the, the different parts of our retina um, a, a, um, interpret value, color relationships, and details differently. So, um, so now with the eraser, I can start to suggest some of the lighter areas on the stone. Little dots and dashes. And I try to limit myself only one mark at a time before I make an observation and then make another mark because it's so easy for me to get into a rhythm and start just going dot, 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 dot across the stone. I'm going to make one stop, look, find another one, indicate it. Even if it's not accurate, you're reacting to something in an individual way. Um, I do want to add a little bit of texture on this side of the stone. So hopefully that makes sense, what I'm saying about um, texture and observations. All right, so I need, I'm going to move over here. I've already erased this part of the hillside a couple of times, and I keep smudging it. All right, I'm going to, there, drop that down a little bit. That's probably better. So now I need to reestablish that hillside. I've lost my clouds, that's okay. It doesn't take long to reestablish them. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna come back to that later um, because I may end up smudging again anyways. All right, back to this. I'm gonna drop in a darker shadow here. Gonna reestablish those just quickly. Um, I noticed in previous drawings you started with vine charcoal and then transitioned to pencils today. Vine hasn't been mentioned. Oh, um, that's a really good question. So I I use the vine charcoal when I'm using charcoal pencils. So I charcoal and charcoal together. Because I'm working with graphite today, I didn't use that. But I do have a graphite block that I sometimes use similarly to how I use vine charcoal. So I, I just didn't do that today. So that was a really good question. Um, but uh, the co combining charcoal and graphite can be problematic um, in that charcoal um, requires more tooth for it to stick to the page, and graphite, being more metallic, tends to smooth out the tooth. And it just, if you try to use charcoal on top of especially a, a really heavily um, rendered graphite area, it, the charcoal will just slip off the page. All right, so I'm just going to reestablish some of these shadows, kind of gestural. Just really place them. Using the side of the pencil, just try to suggest. And now I've got this wall I need to address. Um, something is bothering me here, though. Those diagonal marks are too visible. Um, what I can do, if, if I'm, I'm going to try to be delicate along this edge and just pick up a line in a few areas. Drop a contour line in there and see what that does. I kind of like that. And I want to do that up here as well. Just to bring a little bit more clarity to some of these forms. All right, I think that works. I don't want to do one here. Um, 
But I think I'm going to see what happens if I drop a that line here, see if I can pop that out a little bit. And just bring that out a little bit more with just a few dots along that edge. Uh, Heather is saying, what's the difference between vine and willow charcoal, the carbon sketch pencil versus compressed charcoal? Okay, so um, practically vine and willow are going to be used very similarly. They're going to have a very similar effect. The only difference is that they're literally made from different things. So willow charcoal is made from a willow stick. Vine charcoal is made from grapevines. Uh, but they're made from the same process and they have a very similar uh, kind of use in the process, and I'll interchange fine with willow. Um, the you know some I I don't pay attention enough <laughs> to the differences between them, but um, some tend to be kind of scratchier and have more imperfections in them so, than others. Um, and and I I want to say that is typically the willow charcoal, but I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, and sometimes I want kind of a harder charcoal that can sometimes be, you know, that you play with. So, but try that. And then a carbon sketch, um, it, it's, I believe it's essentially graphite and charcoal powder kind of mixed together, but I'm not 100% sure. I know it's, the result is something that is kind of a hybrid between the two. And I'm not sure if that, if, if they affect, um, or they change things with the binder in that. So, I, I don't really know, <laughs> but those are really good questions. So uh, hopefully that helps. Um, and Jane is saying drawing helps with anxiety. That is great to hear. It certainly does for me. For me, it's this is what brings my brain into focus um, more than anything else. Um, all right, so I'm looking at the stone wall, and I said earlier at the onset that I don't want any details here to compete with this being the focal point. Um, uh, oh, F, uh, F4Dog, um, my brain missed vine charcoal versus graphite pencils. Yeah, so I don't use graphite pencils with vine charcoal. I use charcoal and charcoal, so vine charcoal and compressed charcoal pencils would, could be used together. And the graphite you want to use separately than with charcoal. I mean, I, I have you know, technically I've mixed those two before. I've certainly experimented. So I don't want to discourage you ever from experimenting. But in general, what happens is the graphite um, creates a surface that makes it less, res you know, or more resistant to um, accepting charcoal on top of it. Um, I, I mean, I have certainly integrated the two together, but it's generally not to very good results. So this is, uh, I'm really kind of being just gestural with this stone wall. I'm not being very accurate. Um, what I'm observing is that generally it's in shadow, just kind of thinking out loud here. Generally it's in shadow, but it gets darker right in here as it gives us a sense of that curve. And then we get a little bit more light here. So I'm going to try to emphasize that. Um, so as you can see, I'm just using the broad side of the pencil. I'm rolling it in my fingers as I do it. Um, and I'm trying to be aware of where I want a hard edge. So like right along here where it might represent that ground line. I want to stop short along an edge. But up here, I might be lifting off and maybe changing the direction of my marks to reflect the, you know, the, the shapes of the... Um, of the stones. I also want to just think about visual rhythm along that edge. Um, this, when I look at the stone wall, it feels very naturally formed. There's, feels like a piece of nature because there's an ir irregularity to it. There's a sense that there's a, a thinking behind it that somebody arranged these, but they're arranged irregular stones. And so there's no repeated pattern here. As I move across, I'm going to kind of lighten up a little bit. And then here, where we see this grass overlapping, it, that bottom edge changes. So I'm kind of scooping and lifting into that grass area. And as we come over here, 
Again, a harder edge against that ground plane. So again, just thinking about shape and direction of the marks. And then I can kind of emphasize the horizontal nature of this ground plane by changing up the direction of my marks a little bit. As I move down here. All right, um, see if there's any, uh, Jane is saying, we'll ask what the book is. The book is called See, Think, Draw. So there's a link to it in the description and it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's available for pre-order, uh, but it won't come out in print until June. Um, it covers a lot of the stuff we do here. I tried to simplify it down and in, in the book, I tried to think through like what are really kind of the essential skills and build it on this idea of giving yourself specific projects to work on so that you're you're developing particular skills through specific subjects. Because um, that's what we do as artists. You're gonna, you know, if you take a drawing course, you, you're gonna start somewhere, you're gonna learn a lot of the basics and then you just keep learning them over and over again. You keep challenging yourselves to understand those basics more deeply. And, you know, in general, in, you know, as you, in general, when you learn things, you keep, you, you keep building on to previous knowledge. And you do that with art to some degree, but a lot of what you're actually doing is expanding a core concept and actually getting to know those core, those core concepts with just a, a greater and, and more expansive um, kind of nature. And, and so in order to do that, you, know, you, you just keep challenging yourself. So then picking subjects that can challenge you in a particular way that's going to help you to grow. That's kind of what the, the overall philosophy is. All right, so I'm going to, let me see where I'm at. It starts to read like a stone wall here. So when I like, quick, quickly glance at it, I'm like, all right, that reads somewhat like a stone wall, not quite there. So I need, I need to continue to work on this and find that right balance where I can get an initial reaction to this as a stone wall while still recognizing this as the primary focal point. Um, and again, this is where there might be some subjectivity and you might uh, interpret this differently than the way I do. So I'm gonna switch to this subtractive process and erase out some of these lights on the, the stones, especially along the top edge here where that light seems to catch it more. That helps to create some visual separation. And I'm not doing a lot of calculating. This is really just a reaction. Um, what I might do though in a quick second is when I'm looking at something, I'm targeting an area in the reference photo, I'm targeting the, the, a particular area in this um, stone wall and I'll take a quick note of generally where I am. So especially relative to the castle. So as I look here, I'm taking note of this, there's this kind of whiter um, stone here that's directly below here. Um, and then, so again, I'm doing a quick glance and in that split second, taking mental note of what is, generally what is it, light shape, where is it relative to um, this, this castle here. So, um, it's all very close and you can, I find in general, it's better to take a lot of quick glances than one long one. I'm going to try to just make some general observations about the nature of the stones, where are they bigger, where are they flatter, thinner, like you, generally the larger stones are at the bottom and you work your way to smaller, thinner stones at the top. This reminds me that the, it was actually drawing a stone wall is the first memory I have of when something really clicked and I wanted to be an artist. And that was in first grade, first or second grade. Gosh, I can't remember now exactly when. First or second grade, we had an illustrator come in and 
and help us with writing a story and then illustrating it. And I, I remember my story, in, I wanted to do a stone wall, and I drew all the stones as perfect little circles. And this, te and this teacher said, you know, you think about a stone wall. She got me to think about that, the fact that they're all different sizes and they all lock together. And that blew my head. And, um, and then I started creating that with irregularity and it got me to think of like, gosh, what else am I drawing that I'm not really looking at? If I think about what happens in life and I'm not kind of caught in my, um, you know, kind of preconceived notions or I'm not just kind of reacting to an idea, what, um, you know, how, how would that influence my marks? And uh, stone walls are awesome. Okay, so now it's starting to come together. So I, I'm starting to suggest stones in this area. And what will happen is that you'll notice that, you know, finishing one area might create the impression that, that the rest is finished. I don't think I've reached that point yet, but I'm looking for that to kind of take off. Something will click and we say it's just finished enough for me to accept it as a stone wall and actually start to project um, project information onto it that doesn't exist. You know, I want I want to be able to look at this in my mind to make up stones that aren't there, light that isn't there. I love this little light here on the stone on that ground. Wish I remembered who, what that, what teacher that was. And I believe it was somebody who came in. It wasn't, it wasn't a teacher. It was somebody that the, my teacher had brought in to teach us. That was awesome. Teachers are the best. If you are like a public school teacher, private school teacher, professor, I give you nothing but gratitude. I think, especially like. Public school art teachers are the unsung heroes of the art world. Don't get the credit they deserve. Especially if they've been helpful in encouraging people to explore the arts. All right. I think that kind of works. Um, I know there are some lighter stones in this that I want to actually kind of ignore. Um, I, actually, what I want to do is provide a little bit more structure to the top ridge. So I'm kind of recalling some of the things we talked about in the Degas episode last week, hatch marks and directions. So I'm actually using kind of hatch marks to build up these small areas. Let me see if I can zoom in. How's everybody else's drawing coming? If you're new, what you're watching is drawing together. It's all about us getting together to draw. If you want to follow along, this will be available as a, as a replay um, as soon as this is done. Um, but you can find the reference image in the description below. And you're welcome to follow along. Share your work when you're done with artistnetwork.com. There's a link to there as well. All right. Oh, what do I think? What do I think? What do you think? What do we all think? I'm going to now clean up the sky like I talked about doing because I messed it up multiple times now. So just drawing with the eraser. Remember what I had talked about in terms of composition. I want to bring something up to kind of reflect about reflect that general um, thrust of the, the castle. 
And then I can just kind of clean up that edge a little bit. Clean this up. And actually, I think what I want to do is just kind of lighten this. I'm going to actually create a kind of a wash with the eraser here. Just to push the contrast just a bit on that side. Because I love how, you know, the, the value relationship inverts from left to right here, where this is light against this, and now it's dark against that. Um, so I just want to kind of play that up a little bit. make leave those hatch marks visible to suggest texture but so I think overall there we have it I think it works well as a as kind of a field study I imagine if I were out there on the on these you know the highlands here it looks like where they're where it um, if I were on location and I had a couple hours to sit and draw I might come up with something like this um, maybe take a photograph of it bring it into the studio and work with both the photo and the reference to come up with something but um, uh, thank you all. Uh, Samana saying most of the white stones are grouped into groups made of three. That's interesting. I wonder if there was an intentional pattern there made by the people who made that stone wall. It's a good observation. Uh, so a very cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the comments. Oh, Believer Keeper, who thinks of the catchy titles? Those are me. I can't help the dad joke from coming in. Um, that's part of my favorite process. Part of the whole process is coming up with the titles. Um, can I put, oh, can I put it in schedule a knight in armor? That could be good. Um, I will look, if I can find a good reference, um, let me see what I can do about that. Thank you. And if anybody else has suggestions, I'm planning out right now. I've got the rest of the month figured out in most of March, but we're going to continue on. So, all right. So here we have it. I hope this worked out well. Um, for you all. I want to thank you all for joining me. It's been another fantastic Drawing Together episode. I'm so deeply gra grateful for all of you for joining me and making this what it is. So share it with your friends. Bring them on. You know, if you know anybody who could benefit from just taking some time out of their lives to draw and they need a safe place to do so, come here. That's what we're all about. Um, I appreciate you. I can't wait to see your drawings. So if you, if you need to find it, the link for the page to share your work is in the description below the video. Um, again, my name is Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together. We meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. So have a fantastic rest of your week.